Hello and welcome to another Atypical Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce. This is ATP Geopolitics and this is a Ukraine War Update Extra video where I give you the extra juicy nuggets to give you a greater understanding and appreciation of the war in Ukraine. Obviously, we don't appreciate it in that sense. It is pretty horrible. Where should we start today? Well, I will start with Russia being on fire again. Another case of, in this, at this time in St. Petersburg, another case of something in Russia being on fire. Business center of Bereg, uh, fire broke out, evacuated empl employees, watch how the storage facilities burn out. Again, does it have anything directly to do with the war? Possibly not. Uh, does it have anything indirectly to do with the war in terms of insurance claims uh, because the economy is not going well? Maybe. Would that work for these kind of storage facilities? I don't know. But it, it does seem odd that this is happening so often and the length and breadth of the country. Uh, okay, moving on. This is a, an interesting interview and this is one of the pilots that has actually been seen a couple of times on on interviews and social media and whatnot. It's rare to find some interviews with the Air Force soldiers, but here is a fascinating discussion with the well-known Ukrainian pilot, Vadim Voroshilov, with a call sign Karaya. Um, full text is also available on War Translated. Well, I, I'm going to just give you this su summary of what he says. So um, I'm going to just pop down, miss that first bit off. Um, now, this is about how this part of the interview is about how Russian uh, pilots appear to be aiming for residential areas. And is this, you know, because they've got poor mapping and so on, or is it because that's what they've been ordered to do and they're carrying orders? So he says some Russian pilots are who were captured tried to convince that they did not know about the bombing of residential buildings because they are working according to the coordinates provided to them. Is it possible to believe this, as the interviewer um, Karaya says, I do not believe it at all. They have ordinary navigation systems like Garmin, Touristic, in various modifications. Perhaps their public accepts propaganda that Russian aviation does not hit peaceful targets, but our society is quite literate. You do not need to be an aviator to understand. If a person enters latitude and longitude in a tourist navigator, they can clearly see what is there. Of course, if the coordinate is entered with a certain settlement, it is immediately clear that you're working on that settlement. They do it like railway lines, as people say. This is an ordinary aircraft bomb, which is just a flight trajectory, and the accuracy of bombing depends on a bunch of factors, ranging from the skills of the pilot to meteorological conditions. Therefore, I do not believe in this legend. Um, the interview says, what is considered an accurate strike with low precision weapons? Uh, Karaya says, I can say roughly, according to the standards, the enemy's bombing is considered excellent. If it is within plus or minus 50 metres in urban conditions, even this is a huge error. Uh, the interviewer says, let's imagine a hypothetical situation. You are ordered to bomb targets with residential within residential areas. What will you do? Uh, Karai says, we have already discussed this with our sworn brothers. Firstly, I do not want to talk about it hypothetically because it is, in, it is impossible in theory. Our military and political leadership will not allow it. If we look at it more abstractly, the pilot and navigator in the Su-34, the downed plane of uh, Krasnoyatsev, um, who's a Ukrainian pilot, I believe, always see the target's location, at least through navigation. Yes, they are given a task to perform, but no one will fire them and no one will put them in prison if they drop bombs, for example, in an open field at a distance of a kilometre or two from residential buildings with overflight or underflight. It will just be a mistake in pilot technique and poor training. That's all. So that's all there is to it. But such an option could be considered if they were people. They fully and completely understand what they're doing. This is a traditional scorched earth tactic. This is what they have done before in Ichkiria, in Georgia, in Syria. The interviewer asks, how do you formulate your attitude toward the enemy? Is there something like respect for their pilots? Karaya replies, we treat them not as a specific living person, but as air targets. They turn it in only into dry figures in the daily summary of the general staff losses of the Russian ar Russian army that is uh, no more of course uh, there were cases of respect for enemy pilots in history but a long time ago in the first world war then there were more noble relations if I may say so back then they declared war signed the act of war and then went to their positions now the enemy has been saying for several months that he was not going to attack and then insidiously attacked peaceful cities of Ukraine in the morning 
um, interviews. Is that something that most dis distinguishes our pilots from the enemy? That's a good question. That um, Karaya says there is a lot to say, but I will only say that we perform such tasks that technically were not even considered at the design stage of our aircraft. We have very limited technical capabilities, but we do everything to destroy the enemy. We try to work effectively in more extreme conditions and are absolutely ready for anything. The enemy having an advantage works as it is written in the textbooks on tactical and fire training. We use more modern methods, which are not written in any textbook of any country in the world. Um, and the interviewer follows on here by saying, so NATO pilots will have something to learn from ours after this war? Yes, he smiles. I think that's really interesting, actually. And you could say this, I, I talked about this the other day in terms of, um, in terms of artillery, uh, for example. The Ukrainian people on the ground, the soldiers, the artillerymen have been working these machines uh, to a greater extent than any of the trainers of the NATO forces around the world. I mean, these guys have been hammering uh, their their cannons, have firing them howitzers at the enemy day after day after day for month after month. There, there is probably nothing they don't know about these machines now, and how they work on the battlefield. And you will you will have a case after this war is over where the Ukrainians will be the experts. Now I am the master, uh, and they will be training their the NATO. Uh, forces you know in return and and you could say this with the pilots you know these guys have had more combat experience than probably any pilot in in the american air force in the u.s air force for example so you know so it's a real really interesting switch there um uh, so the interview says is it playing a cruel joke with the russians that they have so much equipment do they act as they say at ease or not uh, Karai says, you are right, but do not underestimate the enemy. He is dangerous. I have a negative attitude to the statements uh, that there are some uh, Chmoni and the rest. I don't really understand what that is. No, this is the enemy. They have significant advantage in aircraft and ground air defence. They know how to work and learn from this war, just like we do. When we talk about the comfortable conditions for the enemy, we mean the ability of the fighter aircraft to operate without entering our air defence zone. But when they get into this zone, every time in the reports from the general staff, you see pluses opposite the destroyed air targets. Um, so interesting stuff there. Uh, things to consider in terms of how these guys view the, the Russian counterparts. Um, and obviously, there isn't a great deal of respect. They think that they are you know, taking out uh, residential civilian targets pretty much indiscriminately where they could choose not to do so. Or, but then, of course, the Russian army might be, or Russian air force might be very different. You know, you you come back saying, "Oh, I missed. I dropped it on some fields." Then you could end up being, you know, uh, end up in, in a jail somewhere, so on and so forth. So I I wonder, you know, what the differences are in those respects between the two forces. But um, that's a really interesting interview. Okay, moving on. Well, actually staying on the Air Force vibe here. The Russian Air Force has received more Su-57s this year than since they began military service in 2018. This definitely indicates what many people have already said, that the Russian military industrial complex is in full swing trying to support the war effort. I talked about this with the manufacturer of it was it KH-101 cruise missiles and how, or is it uh, the other 55... Um, either, either way, the, the Russians are still making them. Yeah, maybe they are not making them at a sustainable level, so they're using cruise missiles at a, a greater rate than, than they're able to replenish their stocks. However, they are making them, and, and Russia is getting around sanctions. They will probably have a lot of assistance from you know countries like Iran, China, um, and some of the Eurasian nations, uh, possibly, who are allied to them. But it's, it, you know, it's easy to say, oh, sanctions are biting, they can't make this, they can't do that, oh, they're stymied, yeah. But, it, but in reality, that, that, that won't be happening, or at least not to the extent that many people would like. Um, so these are SU or Su-57 fighters. Just to give you a quick intro to the Su-57, the Sukhoi Su-57, uh, Sukhoi's internal designation for the aircraft is T-50. The Su-57 is the first aircraft in Russian military service designed with stealth technology and is intended to be the basis 
for a family of stealth combat aircraft, a multi-role fighter capable of aerial combat as well as ground and maritime strike. The Su-57 incorporates stealth, super maneuverability, super cruise, integrated avionics, and substantial internal payload capacity. After repeated delays, the first Su-57 entered service with the Russian Aerospace Forces of EKS in December 2020, so really relatively recently. The fighter is expected to have a service life of up to 35 years and they are creating some more as as we speak they're they're getting them as according to um ocean defender here getting them away in fact rob lee this comes from as well uh getting to the russian forces for use uh, i've not heard of any explicit usage of them but it'll be interesting to see if anything develops out of that um now some people mentioned this in my thread to them the video today which is what have you heard about this su-27 that was down near the engels air base so i talked to you about Ed, the engels air base in russia which was over in saratov over here that had a drone strike the other day and uh, there was apparently today um some people saying a drone was shot down by saratov again and then other people saying actually no it turns out it wasn't a drone it was a su uh, 27 and the russians shot one of their own down in in a bit of friendly fire so the the rumor goes lots of people reported this and then they have retracted so some of my sources like no reports and tender have both retracted their what they were saying about this because it, they felt it's too much like rumor um, so, uh, you know, mostly Telegram parroting. So on Telegram, these these rumors were going around, uh, probably not correct, but could be. But without any kind of substantial evidence, I don't want to be a rumor monger just to let you know that there is a rumor out there. I suppose that is being ru a rumor monger, isn't it? Um, but uh, just try I'm not reporting on that officially uh, as a thing that's happened. I'm actually saying it's more likely a rumor. Um, OK. And uh, yeah, here's uh, the governor of the Saratov region, Roman Busagin. According to him, a drone was shot down in the Engels district from the fall of the wreckage. The fence of a private house, a car and a garage were damaged. In one of the houses, a window on the balcony was knocked out. OK, so this uh, this is interesting. And, and as Noel reports says, if something really happened, footage of the damn fighter jet or other visual confirmation should clarify. We'll wait for that. But if this is actually a drone that has gone down, then then that is itself pretty interesting significant to, because it shows that the U ukrainians are sending out further drones to angles um so yeah right i'm going to move on to bakhmut and i'm going to continue to talk about this idea of uh, the russians culminating as reported in the isw institute for the study of war american military think tank now i just very quickly rushed over this this morning i mentioned it yesterday as well but uh, there's a a larger analysis of this in the ISW. I talked about this paragraph. I read out this paragraph to you, but I just want to give you some of the indications of of the idea that the Russians have culminated in Bakhmut. So again, what does culmination mean? It's a military terms. It means that the point at which a force can no longer uh, no longer has the capability to continue its form of operations, offense or defense. Um, uh, when a force cannot continue the attack and must assume a defensive posture or execute an operational pause, which is to say they're not losing or anything they're not on the on the back foot they just run out of momentum they've run out of resources to continue uh, in this case an offense now what they go on to say the isw that that even though they could be culminating they may nevertheless continue to attack aggressively um and in ineffective squad size assaults against back moot um though they're very like unlikely to they are very unlikely to make operational operationally significant gains so they could be still you know acting as if they hadn't culminated and and fighting still really aggressively but actually that it's quite an empty gesture because there's just nothing left in the tank behind um so here are the indicators that the isw list uh to support the assessment that the russian forces have culminated in and around bakhmut so senior ukrainian officials uh, visiting the frontline positions in Bakhmut have done so in an unimpeded fashion. Uh, Ukraine's military intelligence director directorate, um, Budanov, visited Bakhmut on the 27th, 28th, uh, and was geolocated to within 600 meters of the previously recorded Russian forward line of troops. His visit supports previous Ukrainian social media reports that Ukrainian forces conducted a tactical counterattack that repelled Russian forces from the outskirts of Bakhmut on December the 21st. 
and then the that was just after the U Ukrainian president has visited. However, since then, I must say that the Russians have been on the counteroffensive and have regained some territory. So I don't know whether that claim is somewhat mitigated. Um, Russian combat footage supports ISW's previous assessment that Russian forces are operating in squad size assault groups due to combat losses. Combat footage posted on December 26th shows Ukrainian fire defeating squad size groups of five to ten unsupported Russian infantry attempting a disorderly assault on Novosibirsk in Luhansk Oblast. So actually this is up, this is nowhere near Bakhmut, this is up in Luhansk, uh, just to let you know. Um, this is Novosibirsk, which is north um, west of Svatova, uh, next to Kuzmivka. But the, uh, the idea here is that fighting in these unsupported roles, that means they don't have either mechanized units supporting them in an assault they don't have artillery particularly they're just like throwing people at at the enemy and in very in very small kind of ineffective numbers um so this footage while not from bakhmut is consistent with a senior ukrainian officials report that russian forces in the bakhmut area are no longer operating as company and battalion tactical groups but are instead operating in smaller groups of 10 to 15 service members squad size organizations as of december 27th and what they said um the other day is that that's really similar to how they acted in Kherson, just when they had kind of come to the end of what they could do in Kherson, and in, in the end ended up withdrawing from there. They were working in kind of unsupported squad size, or well, certainly squad size groups. Um, and and that, if, if the same is happening in Bakhmut, it could be a reflection of that Kherson scenario. Russian Airborne Forces VDV are reportedly augmenting Wagner Group operations around Bakhmut. So this is something that we've seen, which is the general Russian army as well as um, DPR militia working with the Wagner Group, possibly because the Wagner Group don't have enough uh, capacity now, or possibly because they're so desperate to get Bakhmut. I don't know, but it but it shows that I think that possibly all was not going as well as Wagner might have liked. A Russian source reported that Wagner and VDV elements conducted joint operations in Bakhmut on December the 27th. The report, if true, marks an inflection given that the Wagner Group has been conducting information operations to assert that Wagner Group forces exclusively are operating in Bakhmut. The conventional Russian military supporting Wagner Group elements in Bakhmut after Wagner took efforts to emphasize it uh, exclusively is responsible for the Bakhmut sector would be consistent with indicators for the Wagner Group forces culmination. ISW has previously assessed that Wagner Wagner Group forces are serving a chiefly attritional role around Bakhmut and have therefore likely become degraded to a near debilitating extent and need reinforcement from more conventional Russian elements. High rates of attrition amongst the forces responsible for the offensive on Bakhmut may expedite the culmination unless notable numbers of regular Russian military units are sent to sustain the offensive and delay or avert its culmination. I mean, at the end of the day, there, there, there can be only so many people they can pull out the prisons to throw into Wagner. They, they've probably got all of the vol volunteers they're gonna get. You know, if, you, if you're suddenly thinking after 10 months, oh, do you know what, I might join Wagner now as a mercenary, like maybe I guess the economy is tanking in Russia so people get pretty desperate. You might have that kind of uh, effect happening, who knows, but it, it seems unlikely you're gonna get a large amount or a, a large influx of volunteers on a consistent basis. Once you've exhausted that volunteer, that, this is precisely why they went to the prisons, because they needed considerably higher, greater numbers. Uh, and that was that was a, a source of personnel they, where they could you know pretty much force people to come with them. And that if they died, so there are reports now that, that some of these um, former convicts uh, are have have been killed and they're just burning their bodies and destroying all evidence of them actually being in Wagner pretty much. So they can just say, oh, they joined Wagner, but we don't know where they are. We think they deserted or they're missing action. So then they don't have to, I don't know, make any payments, do any paperwork, whatever, whatever the reason is. Um, it's, yeah. So I, I think it's probably quite likely that Wagner are going to be struggling for numbers going forward. It's not an inexhaustible um, source of personnel that they're drawing on. Uh, yeah, they could probably get more convicts, but really, 
you know, the Russian army has a greater scope, I think, for mobilizing large amounts of troops than Wagner does. Uh, just my two, tuppence, two cents. Um, five cruise missile, moving on to the cruise missile thing that happened today. So I reported, because the initial reports were that 120 cruise missiles were sent over, or missiles, is actually, I think a lot of them were probably S-300s. Uh, and, you know, this this claim is that five of them were shot down by man pads. We'll talk about that in a second, actually. Let, let's just talk about uh, really what happened. And the figures are still coming out now. Um, there were reports that there were 120 um, from Mikh Mikhailo Podolyek, um, who was a presidential advisor. Uh, and then Ukraine's military has come out and said, actually, there were 69 that were launched and the air defences intercepted 54 of them. And actually, that's actually a lower interception rate than previously. So previously, in the last saturation missile attack, there were 70 missiles and 60 were taken out. So actually, this is a, if 69 is a correct number, this is actually a marginally smaller saturation missile attack. So I, when I was saying that 120, and this is the biggest one so far, this was just basically based on uh, Podolyak's claim. Now, if that is untrue, then that's I think that's a significant difference, actually, because I think that uh, where I was thinking, wow, this is a really big missile attack. They really want this. They're, they're putting out a lot of their uh, stocks. That's a, it's a big number. Now I'm thinking it's a smaller number. And it probably highlights the fact that they don't have the stocks. And it gets back to this, this, you know, the ever, ever existing debate as to whether Russia really are running out of stocks of cruise missiles. They are almost certainly strategically low. Or um, what I mean by that is they're, they're, they're low on stocks to a dangerous level considering overall sort of geopolitical strategy. So if they want to fight against NATO, they are screwing themselves over. They're biting off their nose to spite their face. And that is, uh, it could be a problem going forward, but they almost don't have any option, which is they need to cause as much damage to Ukraine now. I mean, the, the threat is Ukraine now, not NATO in the future. And if they don't, if they don't do something significant with Ukraine, then it's all kind of... It's all pointless anyway. So I can see them eating into their strategic reserves of missiles. But then I can also see them using... So I talked about stocks recently and about how many they likely have. Um, what they do have a lot of are S-300 missiles, which are surface-to-air missiles that can be used in the secondary uh, mode to do surface attacks. And it, and it appears of these 69 missiles today... I don't know what proportion were S-300s, but at least some of them were. Kharkiv was hit with S-300s, I think. Um, Odessa or Mikhail had S-300s as well. So they are using S-300s. I'd uh, be fascinated to see what, what percentage of the saturation missile attack today were cruise missiles and what were not. Um, but talking about the cruise missiles five of them were shot down by man pads and i talked today i get, i showed you some video footage of an igla man pad which is a a, a sort of russian uh, soviet sort of 1981 to present so you know this has been around for some time uh, uh taking out the missile and i sort of just conversationally almost said you know it's amazing how quick these things go obviously they've got to go quicker than the cruise missiles and of course they've got to go quicker than um, than jet fighters. I mean, these things are designed to take out jet fighters. So uh, they they go pretty fast. These Igla, and, and there are faster ones than these, these Igla go 1.9 Mac. Well, what does that mean? Mac is a number. Um, so if you think Mac 1, Mac 2, this is Mac 1.9. Uh, a Mac number is a ratio of an object's speed to in a given medium to the speed of sound in that medium. So Mach 1 then is a speed of sound around 761 miles an hour at sea level on a standard day. The term is also used as a metaphor for high speeds more generally. So Mach 1, 761 miles an hour. Well, actually, that's faster than a, jet, a subsonic. So a subsonic uh, cruise missile is one that goes under the speed of sound, and then a supersonic cruise missile is one that goes over the speed of sound. So it depends what the cruise missile was. But assuming that the one we saw today was maybe... Um, uh, KH-101 or KH-55, these are, are long-range subsonic 
cruise missiles. You can get like, you know, the Caliber and other KH uh, models are supersonic. Uh, they'll go faster. But these ones fly at about 500 miles an hour or 800 kilometers an hour. So if you're talking about, you know, 1.9, uh, that is 1,457 miles an hour. Uh, and in kilometers an hour, that is, um, here we go, 2,346 kilometers an hour. Um, so at 1.9, obviously, it's going to be going uh, something like almost three times the speed of the missile it's chasing, that cruise missile. And so, yes, that that IGLA, was, that manpad missile was pretty quick and it needs to be uh, it doesn't have a huge range probably five kilometers in fact let's have a look at the igla um most man pads seem to have like a five five kilometer range um it depends whether you're talking up at an angle or whatever and how high the thing is that it's the the, the target is so here we go um uh duh, 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 duh. We have operational range, five kilometers, IGLA 1, 5.2, the IGLA and the IGLA 6 kilometers, um, and then the flight ceiling, 3.5 kilometers. So, it, you know, upwards, it can only go so high. Um, uh, yeah, just fast things, right? Uh, I guess that's all I'm saying. Um, okay, last thing to talk about is this uh, an interesting piece in, I always say things are interesting because I'm interested in all this stuff, uh, uh, Politico. Uh, do, 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 report, sorry, words. Ah, um, for first javelins, then high Mars, now Patriot. What's next? And this is go a lot of preamble talking about lots of different things, but then sort of gets onto the whole ATACM's discussion, um, which is kind of what everyone seems to want. Um, with high Mars, have shown themselves to be a game changer, but there's a certain amount of adaptation that's that's happened with high Mars. So, for example. You know, when you look at the map of Ukraine, you think, right, high miles are hitting. Uh, they're being placed all around here and they they can hit so 84 kilometers plus. And you've got around the back of the area, the Wagner saying we are not having any ammunition depots uh, in 100 kilometers from the front line. That makes logistics difficult for Wagner for the front line here. And they have to manage it. It's, it's less efficient. However, it is a way of adapting to the threat of high miles. High miles are still hitting uh, it, troop accumulations and other. There are still depots. There's still stuff being stored and they are hitting them. All, all around this area still causing a problem uh, tokmak is an interesting one it's like russians don't seem to learn and they still still do pile stuff in the same place and ukraine hits them with high mars uh, but there is a certain element of adaptation to the high mars anyway let's have a uh, have a look at what this article says so the high mods was a game changer uh, danny luke said so this is um let's find out who exactly that is that is Alexander uh, Daniluk, a former secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council. So that's who he is. He says, right up until Russia managed to learn how to adapt to it. Now we kind of reach the limit of what we can do with these advanced weapons. For the next stage, we need the longer range weapons to achieve the goals that we achieved four months ago when we first received the HIMARS. We can do the same, but the range should be longer. Hodges, but that's Ben Hodges, who well worth following on Twitter, by the way, uh, the former U.S. Army Europe commander, argued that ATACM's missiles are exactly what they need right now. The longer range weapons would allow Ukraine to hammer key Russian positions, such as a Kerch bridge, Russian air bases on Crimea and communication lines. Zelensky brought the weapon up during his talks with Biden, but the U.S. hasn't budged in its refusal to send them the person said so this is someone close to to the ground here now that is a huge shame if that's true it just you know i know atacans won't be the panacea but they will be super useful that range uh they can be shot down so on and so forth but the range is has got to be like is it well it's exactly what ukraine need now so if they i mean we know that the Russians, sorry, the Russians have moved stuff back to Crimea to keep it safe, back to uh, Jankoy, back to other places in, in northern Crimea, further behind the lines in Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, you know, ATACMs would then allow everything to be fair game in the occupied territories. And that's, you know, got to be, it's got to, they, the US and 
others just have to be they have to get these to, to Ukraine, just please. While those longer range missiles remain atop of Ukraine's wish list, other weapons could help Kyiv continue its offenses around Bakhmut. And in the south, military leaders have said for months that US Abrams tanks and German Leopard tanks would tip the scales in some of the closer range ground fighting they expect to see over the winter. I'm not so sure about this. Yes, they will help, but they won't be a game changer like HIMARS. I think you would need an awful lot of tanks uh, of a, a far greater superior uh, superiority to the Russian tanks for them to be a game changer. But I just don't think tanks are going to be a game changer. I just they'll be. Don't get me wrong. You know, better tanks will be better. Will be good for Ukraine. Um, and, and yes, I fully endorse NATO and the West and, and allies giving them to Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian officials, to continue, have asked that by the Biden administration to send just a handful of Abrams tanks, as few as three or four, to break German resistance to sending their own leopards, according to one person familiar with the discussions. German officials have said publicly they don't want to be the first country to send their own tanks to the fight. So the pitch by Kiev is that even a small number of Abrams tanks would remove that obstacle. It's interesting. So if America gives a bunch of Abrams, that's going to be uh, just fuel for Russia to fuel to the fire of them claiming that this war really is with America. Look, America are giving these big tanks. So it's got to be America give them to then inspire other nations to straight away follow suit. So it's not just going to be, oh, this is a war with America. Um, yeah, so Poland has donated 250 older Russian-made T-72 tanks and the US is paying for Chechia, so the Czech Republic, to upgrade a, a, another 45 T-72s for Ukraine. But no Western-made tanks have yet been delivered. And this is kind of this arbitrary line between like, oh yeah, we can give them T-72s, right? Uh, the old sort of Russian-made T-72s, that's fine, but we can't give them any other main battle tank. It's like, because that's an escalation. Like, I, I just don't get it. it. It seems just a bit of an excuse. While US defense and military officials say tanks are not off the table, obviously, sorry, I'm going to interrupt myself. Obviously, there are other reasons not to give NATO tanks. You know, they want to keep hold of that uh, tech. They don't want it exploited by the Russians. They don't want Russians capturing these tanks because that will almost certainly happen. So there are other considerations and further arguments to be made. But just in general, with there it seems to be these arbitrary uh, cutoff lines between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And, and I don't think there's much justification for those lines. While US defense and military officials say tanks are not off the table, some argue that, that the training and logistics challenges associated with giving these weapons to Kyiv would prove counterproductive. Kyiv is also calling for cluster munitions, interesting, which Russia has been using to deadly effect on the battlefield. But these weapons, officially called dual purpose improvised conventional munitions, are banned by more than 100 countries and are there is no appetite, appetite in the Biden administration to send them. Instead, the US and other countries continue to send tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition from, and mortars every few weeks as part of each new aid package. So just to finish off here, there's, there are some more interesting points here. Um, experts argued that more sophisticated weapons such as Patriot System and the ATACMs are not as important to the coming fight as effective training, logistics and tactics. Patriot, for example, is a long-range, high-altitude missile system used against intercontinental ballistic missiles and high-flying jets. One Patriot will not be enough to defend Ukraine's entire 500-kilometer front, Hurtling said. So that's um, Mark Hurtling, who's a, a former uh, military man, well worth following on Twitter again, I say that, <laughs> stressing that it, is, it must be used in combination with mid-range and low-range low altitude air defenses. Patriot are not going to do the kinds of things people think they are going to do right now, he said. It's not a be-all and end-all in terms of providing the air defense Ukraine needs. Now, I think it's interesting that, that the claim here is that actually training logistics and tactics, effective training, is really super useful and more useful, arguably, than the odd Patriot here and there. I think that's a, that's a point for discussion. Uh, go for it down in the threads below. Biden White House has flatly refused uh, to send aid, aid tokens because it views the weapon as too escalatory. Quote, the idea that we would give Ukraine material that is fundamentally different from than is already going, there would have to be, there would have 
a prospect of breaking up NATO and breaking up the European Union and the rest of the world, Biden said during a press conference with Zelensky. They're not looking to go to war with Russia. They're not looking for a third world war. Ukraine will defend itself at any cost, says Alexei Danilov, the head of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council. Uh, it's in an interview, and I love this bit. It will use the weapons that we have, and even if we don't have those weapons, we will fight with our teeth to get Russia out of our lands. And there you go. Now, on this point of uh, giving Abrams to inspire Germany to change their position and to give some leopard tanks, as was said in this paragraph here, uh, Tendar, reported, Tendar's a German source actually, says Germany's opposition leader, Friedrich, Friedrich Mertz, from the Christian Democratic Union, uh, demands, so they are the opposition, that's the party of Angela Merkel, uh, they are the party now in opposition, demands that Leopard 2 tanks too, uh, are sent to Ukraine. The delivery of Leopard 2 tanks will shorten the war, is the quote. Slowly but surely, we are coming to the point where Schultz will have to yield. So there's now internal pressure within Germany with the largest opposition party saying, we need to give Leopard 2 tanks. Let's just get this thing done. Let's get it over. Let's give them stuff. Um, so I, I'll be fascinated if I will this happen next couple of weeks, will we start to see an escalation of material sent over? Um, and of course, that would get the the Russians in all sorts of a, a paddy. Uh, you know, ah, escalation, escalation, dudes. You just invaded a country. Don't talk about escalation. That is the ultimate escalation. So just uh, rank hypocrisy on on the Russian parts. I I I, I detest this kind of like oh, escalation, escalation. I I do understand it, and of course you have to be careful. But uh, personally, I would have I I have already said. In fact, you know, if you check out uh, one of my uh, recent um, articles for Only Sky, where where I'm a journalist, the uh, that was on this idea that Putin Putin is kind of impotent really in in the threats he's not going to go nuclear he won't go nuclear if we uh, give them a tackens um and he, he he's got nowhere else to go so you might as well just push the envelope just give them a tackens give them some tanks and go yeah i don't think you're going to go nuclear over just you know escalating to slightly longer range missiles i mean we're already giving them missiles or we're already giving them tanks we're just going to give them nato tanks and if if Putin wants to kick off about that, he's going to have a, a a pretty difficult job to try and convince everyone that that that's worthy of a nuclear uh, holocaust. So I would give him a tank and I give him tanks, but you know it's easier for me to say sitting sitting in my house in in the south of England, you know whatever. Anyway, uh, there you go. That's enough from me. You've heard enough from me today. Um, thank you. Thanks for all your support. Really, really appreciate that. As ever. A huge thanks to my new members of the channel. It's fantastic. Tyler Crockett, John Lloyd, Memoz, Mitch Mazzarol, of course, legend. Uh, Kevin Alexander, Yanonis Kilioris, and Ian Ratner, uh, members of the ATP Geopolitics Club. Thank you so much. I'll get some chats going with you guys just to, as members, I'd like you to have some input on maybe a topic for a video that, that I could delve into, uh, do a bit of research on. So uh, look forward to that coming soon. But uh, thank you so much for your support. Really do appreciate that. Anyway, uh, Toodle Pips, really, uh, really appreciate all of your support. Take care.